So I want to talk about the relationship between inflation and Bitcoin. So a little about inflation, a little about Bitcoin, and a little about uh, how they interact. Uh, and the topic began when Bob asked me, would you rather talk about inflation or Bitcoin? <laughs> I said, I can do both. Uh, but thinking about it was actually sort of something I hadn't really combined before. Uh, the basics, uh, let me start with the basics of inflation. And uh, in theory, we have uh, what's known as the quantity theory of money. Better name would be the quantity of money theory of the price level. And uh, it gives you the result that uh, Milton Friedman famously expressed by saying inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So the theory is centered on this uh, accounting identity that maybe you've seen before that basically says total spending equals total income. One person's spending is another person's income, but we can divide the uh, spending into two components, the quantity of money M and the number of times each unit of money turns over in a year. So that's known as the velocity of money. So M times V is just total spending dollars per year or shekels per year. And on the other side of the equation, total income, which, uh, which is broken into the product of the average level of prices times the real output of the economy. Uh, so the price index is in dollars per bundle in a dollar economy and real output is in bundles of goods per year. So the product is again, uh, dollars per year. To talk about inflation, which is the rate of change of the price level, uh, we need a growth rate version of the equation of exchange. And so that's the second equation, the growth rate of the money supply plus the growth rate of velocity. So these are both in percent per year uh, is approximately equal to the inflation rate plus the real growth rate of the economy. And if you prefer uh, diagrams to algebra, I've got a diagram showing that other things equal, if you double the money supply, so that's the vertical line shifting to the right, you cut the purchasing power of the monetary unit in half, where purchasing power is measured by the inverse of the price level, not how many dollars per bundle, but how many bundles you get per dollar. Uh, so you cut the purchasing power of the monetary unit in half when you double the price level, uh, sorry, when you double the money supply. Uh, and in very simple terms, if you take a gallon of milk and you add a gallon of water, you get two gallons of liquid, but it doesn't have any more nutrition than the gallon of milk had in it. You've doubled the volume, but you've reduced the nutritional value per ounce uh, by half. So adding money to the economy dilutes the purchasing power of existing units of money, and that makes prices go up more money chasing the same number of goods, then prices go up. That's the theory. If you prefer some empirics, here's a scatter plot of uh, 110 countries showing the growth rate of the money supply on the horizontal axis and the inflation rate on the vertical axis. And I've circled the point closest to where Israel was uh, 1970 to 1990 when the inflation rate averaged, the annual inflation rate over the period averaged 38.8%. You can't have 38.8% inflation without money growth uh, very close to that. And there's money growth of practically 40%. Uh, why can't you? Because the other alternatives are 40% shrinkage in real output, that doesn't happen. In a, over the course of a business cycle, the growth rate of real output maybe changes from plus two to minus two. That's the range of variation, four percentage points, not 40. Uh, and velocity doesn't change that much. Uh, we'll look at what's been happening to the velocity of money recently, and it's, this is an extreme event and it still it hasn't changed by 40 percentage points. So 
between 50 years ago and 30 years ago, Israel was a high inflation economy. You can see where it is relative to the cluster of other points. Uh, that improved through the 1990s and 2000s. So the inflation rate came down through uh, the central bank learning to better control the growth of the money supply. Uh, and it wasn't just in Israel this was happening, it, although other countries had only double digit inflation instead of 40% inflation. Uh, other countries were also disinflating as central banks learned better how to control the quantity of money. What was it that uh, compelled them to do this? Well, of course, inflation was very unpopular. Uh, but there's possibly a role uh, that currency competition played in this process. So uh, Randy Krosner, who was a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors uh, between 2006 and 2010, I believe, uh, had a paper in which he said, look, what's been happening uh, to improve central bank performance is the pressure of competition. So the spread of information technology, deregulation of financial markets, the ability to move money more cheaply has uh, led to improved central bank performance. So more competition among fiat monies. So this is before uh, Bitcoin was launched. That happened in 2009. But Bitcoin will only add to the competition. How does it improve central bank performance? Well, if the central bank is benevolent or uh, even just image conscious, uh, the more readily available alternative monies are, the easier it is for people to switch to alternative monies when the inflation rate starts to tick up, the quicker the exchange rate will depreciate as they abandon the local money and switch their savings to something else. And so that will pressure central banks more quickly. It'll put more discipline on them. Uh, and so that's a happy result of competition among central banks and hopefully competition with cryptocurrencies. But there's a caveat that I think Krosner overlooked, which is it depends on the central bank uh, being benevolent or at least image conscious. There are other kinds of central banks for whom uh, more competition brings higher inflation. And how does that work? Well, they're driven by revenue. So they're using printing money as a way of financing the government budget. And you can think of the revenue from printing money as like any tax, uh, the product of the tax rate and the tax base. The tax rate is the rate of expansion or if you like the rate of dilution uh, of the purchasing power of money through money growth. And the tax base is the real value of the money people hold. Uh, so it's the nominal money supply divided by the price level. As better substitutes become available, this real tax base shrinks. The value of the money people hold in the domestic monetary unit uh, shrinks. So in order to get the same revenue, if you're taxing a smaller base, you need a higher tax rate. And so those governments increase the rate of money growth. And that's what drives hyperinflation. And we're seeing high inflation bordering on hyperinflation uh, in some countries which have gone this way uh, in recent years. There's another thing it prompts them to do besides print money even faster, which is they try to suppress competition by putting up legal barriers to people switching monies. Uh, so inflation is not currently a problem in Israel or the United States. But recent developments have got people worried. If you look at the Bank of Israel's balance sheet, you see a rapid expansion in the quantity of monetary liabilities. So in January uh, 2021, the M3 or broad measure of uh, the shekel supply was 1489 billions or one point, approximately 1 1.5 trillion, up 23% over the same aggregate a year earlier. So 23% growth in the money supply over a single year. Uh, now, if you just looked at that and 
and assumed everything else was constant, you would have to predict 23% increase in the inflation rate. Uh, fortunately, other things aren't equal. If you look at the uh, most recent figures for inflation, it was actually negative between those two points, January 2020 and January 2021. How is that possible to have negative inflation with 23% money growth? Well, this is a rare case where you had a big change in vo uh, velocity. You had Im implied more than 25% shrinkage uh, in velocity. What does that mean? That means people are stocking up on money balances. They're not turning them over as rapidly. So people's bank accounts are swelling relative to their income. Uh, and the same thing is happening in the US. I'll show you some charts in a second. And it's happening because people are a bit uncertain about the future. So they're not gonna go out and buy big ticket items. Uh, but secondly, because consumption opportunities have been restricted by all the shutdowns of businesses. People aren't going on vacations. They're not going out to restaurants. They're not going to movies, sporting events, concerts, and so on. So it's kind of in part an, an involuntary accumulation of money balances. Uh, if you look at expected inflation in the shekel, it, it's quite moderate. So people in the market are seeing what's happening, not just to the money supply growth, but also uh, to velocity. Uh, so here's a chart made remarkably made possible by the folks at my central bank. <laughs> uh, the Federal Reserve Economic Database carries monetary aggregates and price level data for Israel. Uh, and here you see Israel M3. Uh, and the chart below is the velocity of M3. Uh, it doesn't quite match the figures I gave you earlier because they haven't updated it through the first quarter of 2021. So, or even, sorry, the fourth quarter of 2020. So this is third quarter to third quarter. Uh, but it illustrates what I'm talking about. You've got a big jump or a rise in the rate of growth of the monetary aggregate, but it's being offset, or actually it's designed to offset a big drop in the rate of turnover. Uh, of money balances. Uh, and so if you get that right, if the central bank gets that right, then they can keep inflation moderate uh, even while expanding the money supply at a rapid rate. Uh, same things have been happening in the United States. 25% growth in the M2 aggregate, uh, but it's offsetting 24% shrinkage in the velocity of M2. As long as money growth is matched with movements in velocity in the opposite direction, uh, that's fine. In fact, that's desirable monetary policy. Uh, the problem is exiting. So the exit has to be well-timed in order not to have the money growth continue beyond the period in which velocity uh, continues shrinking. So as the economy recovers, velocity will return to trend. Uh, if we go back to the US case in the Great Recession. Uh, you can see the drop in velocity here, but it came back up to trend. So central banks have to be concerned about that. Velocity is now way below trend, both in Israel and the US. If velocity rises by say, let's say 12%, that'll cause 10 percentage point increase in the inflation rate, assuming 2% growth in real output. So to avoid a spike in inflation, uh, the Bank of Israel and the Federal Reserve are gonna have to withdraw the extra money they've been injecting. And it's difficult to get that timing right because velocity is difficult to forecast, but that means we may see periods of negative inflation, which we've had uh, in the US last year. Uh, we may see 5% inflation before the Fed uh, corrects course. And in fact, uh, I'm not sure what the Bank of Israel is saying about this, but the Fed is saying, we're gonna let inflation run above our target of 2% until we start to react. 
Okay, but to, to talk about the potential of Bitcoin to sort of change the incentives that central banks face, uh, it's not gonna be in countries where inflation is around 2%. There's not much incentive in countries like that to switch to another money. We need to look at the countries where inflation is currently highest. And as I mentioned, there are some countries currently undergoing hyperinflation defined as an inflation rate of 50% or more per month. And of course the poster children are Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and lately Lebanon. Uh, Argentina is also running high inflation. If you add up the populations of all the countries where inflation is currently higher than 10% a year, you get something like 1.2 billion people. So it's a pretty big share of the world population where people have an incentive to shop around for a money that uh, doesn't lose its value quite so rapidly. Uh, and so you see headlines like this in Venezuela, people are dollarizing themselves, meaning they're using the US dollar as a savings vehicle, as a medium of exchange, and as a pricing uh, unit. Uh, and they're not just using physical Federal Reserve notes, although they are doing that. Uh, it's more convenient for them to use electronic forms of dollars, one of which is a system called, in the US it's called Zelle. It's a consortium of major banks have launched this as a peer-to-peer -peer digital dollar. Uh, the photo here is from Venezuela where the taxi cab says, we accept Zaya, that's how they pronounce it. So they've sort of glommed onto the system, although as the headline says, uh, Zelle is not too happy about it being used outside the country because they don't want to get in trouble with the uh, regulators. Uh, so that's Venezuela. Similar headlines in Lebanon, uh, the bank deposits in Lebanon are dollarized about 80% now. And anybody who's selling any big ticket item wants to be paid in dollars. Uh, so what I've recommended to my friends in Lebanon is that they should just get rid of the uh, lira and outright dollarize uh, instead of dealing with the churning of the exchange rate and the restrictions on the use of dollars that are making life chaotic there. In Argentina, same thing, people using dollars, even though it's illegal there. Um, a couple of years ago, I gave a pre-pandemic, I gave a talk in Argentina where uh, they wanted to pay me in dollars. Uh, and so the, the host of the uh, conference disappeared and came back a few minutes later with a wad of $100 bills <laughs> because those were available, whereas he couldn't make the transfer bank to bank, that would have been illegal. I'm not sure whether what he did was legal, but I didn't ask. But we also see headlines about Bitcoin use, at least if you know where to look at sites that track what's going on in Bitcoin. So people are using Bitcoin in Venezuela, partly because there are obstacles to using uh, dollars, either in physical or digital form. There's some activity uh, in Lebanon. Uh, Bitcoin boom might be an exaggeration, but there's some additional use of Bitcoin, likewise in Argentina. So let's talk about Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is something new. It uh, has some similarities to a gold standard, but it's not a commodity. It's intangible form only. Uh, it's not like digital money on a gold standard, which in the old days you could redeem your bank deposit for coins. Bitcoin's not redeemable for anything. It's like a fiat money in that it's doesn't have any commodity backing or redeemability, but it's a private project. But what it does have, instead of a redemption uh, arrangement or conversion into some commodity, is a quantity guarantee. So this is uh, the unique feature and 
one that's very interesting to monetary economists, especially those who've been talking for years about the need for central banks to have a quantity rule. So Bitcoin has a quantity rule and it's not just a guideline, it's written into the program. Uh, the supply of Bitcoin expands only on a preset schedule. Uh, nothing that happens to the price of Bitcoin affects the rate at which the uh, supply of Bitcoin grows. And that schedule is one of a de decreasing growth rate until it maxes out at 21 million Bitcoins. So you might say the model of Bitcoin with the quantity guarantee is like a numbered art print where at the bottom it says, this is print number 310 out of a thousand. Uh, they're guaranteeing to you that they won't print any more than a thousand. And Bitcoin is guaranteeing to you that it won't print any more than 21 million. And that makes it possible for the value to go up without your having to worry about the price being undercut by more uh, units being released. So that's unlike any fiat standard currently prevailing. Some have a kind of inflation target, but that's a lot weaker of a commitment than having it written into a program. Uh, you might ask, can't the program be changed? And the answer is not really. Uh, the code is out there for anybody to inspect. It's an open source code. It can be amended by a consensus of the Bitcoin validators, uh, the ones who run the nodes that contain the decentralized ledgers that validate Bitcoin transactions. So you might say it can be amended by consensus, but it's very difficult to arrive at a consensus to make any change that poses any threat to the integrity of Bitcoin. There have been some technical patches on the code and those have been adopted without any problem. Uh, but even a proposal to enlarge the size of the transaction blocks uh, went down to defeat uh, a couple of years ago. This code was written by somebody whose identity we don't know, who called himself Satoshi Nakamoto. So this kind of adds to the mystery of Bitcoin. Uh, we don't know if it was an individual or a committee of people. Uh, we've all got theories about who it was, but uh, so Bitcoin has remarkably succeeded at creating a valuable asset. It's a bit of a stretch. It's often called a cryptocurrency, but it's a bit of a stretch to call it a currency in that it's not yet money in the usual sense. It's not a commonly accepted medium of exchange. It is accepted within a certain community. It has niche uses, you might say. And the niche that it has found is based on its working outside the banking system and therefore being difficult for government authorities to censor. That is, they can't say, we're gonna stop you from receiving Bitcoin. We're gonna stop you from sending Bitcoin. Uh, it, it probably better called a crypto asset than a cryptocurrency. Although it is used as a medium of a payment in some or value transfer in some cases. Some of the current cases uh, include human rights organizations like in Belarus receiving half a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and distributing it to striking workers in a way the government of Belarus hasn't been able to stop. Uh, there's a human rights activist named Alex Gladstein uh, in the US who's constantly arguing uh, on Twitter about the human rights uh, promotion that is made possible through Bitcoin. Uh, so activists in many countries who are, would otherwise be censored by the government, uh, Nigeria, the democracy protesters in Hong Kong, the Navalny supporters in Russia have been able to uh, move value around without having their bank accounts suspended. Uh, in Venezuela, people are selling their services online, people like editors and artists, 
and getting paid in Bitcoin because it's easy to receive online. Uh, and then in order to buy groceries, they have to sell the Bitcoin locally, but there are black markets in which they can do that. Uh, sell it for either US dollars or uh, Bolivars to buy groceries. People leaving Venezuela who want to take their savings with them aren't allowed to take Bolivars, well, they wouldn't want to, that would take many, many suitcases uh, or dollars out of the country, but they can ship Bitcoin out of the country uh, by uploading it to uh, an account that they can access once they're outside of the country. There are people who use Bitcoin as a cheap so uh, form of international remittances. So it's popular in the Philippines just because it's cheaper than Western Union or MoneyGram. Uh, and in China, people are using Bitcoin peer to peer to avoid surveillance by the state. And the Chinese state is trying to stamp this out and it's introducing its own central bank issued digital currency denominated in yuan to form the, uh, perform the same function, peer-to-peer -peer digital money transfer, uh, basically in order to compete with Bitcoin. But of course, the accounts that the Chinese government is offering are subject to complete surveillance. So uh, if you ask, why do people demand Bitcoin? Well. A lot of people demand Bitcoin today. Most users of Bitcoin, maybe 95%, maybe 98% as an investment vehicle uh, or as a speculative vehicle. But it can't go on forever that the price continues to rise. Uh, and so the economist John Cochran says, even if it's not a, it stops being an attractive long-term investment, there's a rational demand for Bitcoin as a way to move money around outside of the government's attempts to control it and grab wealth. So that's the niche use uh, that I've been talking about. If we look at the value of Bitcoin in circulation, uh, so this is what's called the market cap, which is the price per Bitcoin times the number of Bitcoins. Uh, and I had to put this on a logarithmic scale so that it didn't go off the top of the page. But you can see it's gone from around $1 billion back in 2013 to currently about a trillion dollars. As of March 11th, it was worth slightly more than 1 trillion US dollars, which is quite amazing. Um, not something I would have predicted. Uh, I in fact wrote a paper back in 1989, I think it was, saying, well, there are two ways you can secure the value of money. One is the traditional way of a money back or redemption guarantee. And the other is you could have a limited edition guarantee, but I wouldn't expect that to be a useful money because it means the value would be volatile. Well, that's the model of Bitcoin and it's still not a commonly accepted medium of exchange. So I guess that part of my prediction is doing okay, but it has succeeded as an asset uh, to the point where institutional investors are now getting interested in it and uh, are announcing that uh, this wealth management firm is acquiring $1.5 billion in Bitcoin for our clients. And of course, Elon Musk just announced that Tesla is acquiring Bitcoin. Uh, and he had to apologize on Twitter for being late to the party, but uh, everyone welcomed him. So there seems to be some solid support for the price of Bitcoin. Uh, of course, past performance is no guarantee of future results. So before you invest, <laughs> Uh, be aware that Bitcoin's value could vanish. And from the previous peak in 2018 of about 260 billion of market cap, it dropped to 60 billion a year later. So there have been big swings. 
uh, you have to pick your investment horizon uh, correctly to benefit from the appreciation, well, like with any asset. Uh, but unlike a share of stock, which has a fundamental value based on the earning potential of the collection of assets, the firm that your share gives you one nth of the ownership of, Bitcoin doesn't have any fundamental value in the finance theory sense. It doesn't generate any cash flow like a bond does. It's not redeemable or for anything. It doesn't give you ownership over any real assets. Uh, and so in theory, there are many potential equilibrium prices, including zero. And I'll show you in a second that that's happened to some other cryptocurrencies. But an intrinsically useless asset can have a positive value when agents coordinate on it as a medium of exchange. So that's true of the dollar, that's true of the shekel. They don't have any fundamental value either. They're valued because people expect them to be valued. Um, and as long as people are holding them as a medium of exchange, they're subject to the supply and demand analysis that I started off with. Uh, that's what variations in their value depend on. Uh, there have been some other cryptocurrencies that have fallen to basically zero, less than 1% of their peak value. People sometimes call them bubble coins. There are websites devoted to dead cryptocurrencies and what happened to them. I don't expect that to happen to Bitcoin because it's got a pretty strong consensus based on its first mover advantage. It was the first cryptocurrency. It has proven robust. Its uh, mechanism for validating transactions, for validating transfers, uh, has never broken down. It hasn't been hacked. Uh, and it has an active support community, by which I mean there are lots of for-profit firms arranged around Bitcoin, promoting its use by making it easier to accept, easier to transfer. There are exchanges, there are payment processors, uh, and so on. Uh, but just to continue with the uh, warning side, uh, here are the top five famous crypto tokens that have died. Uh, the most remarkable are XEM, which went from being worth 18 and a half billion US dollars to now being inactive, just not traded anymore. Uh, and Bitcoin Diamond, which went from, it was a clone, sorry, it was a fork from the original Bitcoin that at one point was worth 16 billion and is now worth less than one, well, about 1% of that, sorry, less than 1% of that, about one tenth of 1% of that, 209 million. Uh, and if you look at the causes of the loss of value uh, attributed by whoever made up this chart, they use phrases like low liquidity, which means nobody wanted to trade it, or lack of utility, meaning that it didn't do anything that Bitcoin doesn't do. So if you want to diversify your crypto portfolio, look for coins that do something that Bitcoin doesn't do, provide better security or better anonymity or a better platform for smart contracts like Ethereum. So I said Bitcoin's value could vanish, but so can a fiat currency's value vanish. So this brings us back to inflation. Uh, and here are two economists writing in a publication of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, uh, remarkably. They say, look, uh, state monopoly currencies have no intrinsic value either. And if you look into their history, you can find lots of wild price swings and failures. So it remains to be seen whether the Bitcoin protocol, right, having the issue of the currency controlled by a computer program that is in practice immutable, uh, is more robust than existing fiat currency protocols, which is what? Uh, having a committee that has some kind of commitment to an inflation target in some cases, more or less serious, but 
able to amend its own commitment like the Federal Reserve has done uh, recently. Uh, here's a picture of a fiat currency losing its value. This is the Ecuadorian Sucre, which had a hyperinflation in 1999. And the exchange rate went from about 6,000 to the US dollar to 25,000 to the US dollar in the space of a year. And at that point, Ecuador dollarized. People had already put themselves on the dollar standard and the government found nobody wanted the Sucre. Even government employees didn't want to be paid in Sucres. And the government wasn't getting any tax revenue in real terms because the Sucre was so valueless. So they uh, tossed in the towel. They converted to the US dollar officially and they're still on the dollar, celebrating more than 20 years on the dollar. Uh, here's Venezuela and this picture just covers 2018 to 2019 when the value plummeted. Uh, so it went from 600 to the dollar to 46,000 to the dollar. I looked up yesterday what it is now, it's 1.8 million to the dollar. Right, so that's a fiat currency losing its value. So uh, it's in places like that, places with hyperinflation, that Bitcoin has the best chance of catching on as a widely accepted payment medium. But even there, I would say the US dollar is the alternative currency of first choice. Uh, why? Because it's got a larger network uh, of transactors worldwide uh, and it's got a more stable purchasing power. So the obstacles to Bitcoin being adopted as a world money are the network advantage of the established fiat currencies. It's hard to achieve a critical mass for any alternative currency. People want to be paid in the stuff they know they can turn around and spend. And if you can't spend Bitcoin uh, at the grocery store, you might not want to be paid in Bitcoin. Uh, and so it's a kind of chicken and egg problem. But on top of that, people are not going to abandon currencies, uh, at least currencies with moderate to low inflation for Bitcoin when Bitcoin's value is very volatile. So they may adopt it as an investment vehicle and lots of people do that in all kinds of countries. But using it as a medium of exchange, as a money, uh, is inhibited by the fact that the value doesn't just rise, it rises and falls dramatically. Um, so it's risky to keep your rent money uh, in Bitcoin, right? It could drop 10% tomorrow and you can't pay your rent. This volatility is not going away. Some people have hoped that it would go away as Bitcoin grew in value, uh, but it hasn't gone away. It's baked in because of what I mentioned earlier that the supply is completely unresponsive to the price. So as the price of Bitcoin goes up, there isn't any increase in the quantity of Bitcoin to help moderate that increase uh, in its value. It's all going into the price, all that variation. So if people get excited about Bitcoin, there's a big run up in price. If people lose their enthusiasm, there's a big drop in price. Uh, and as I mentioned, the US dollar is the alternative currency of first choice. So it's got much less volatility than Bitcoin. So we see Bitcoin getting a little bit of a foothold where inflation is very high and there are restrictions on the use of the US dollar or any other foreign currency as in Venezuela and Lebanon. But an obstacle to its wider adoption in those two places is you need internet access to move your Bitcoin and internet access isn't always available. There are electricity outages uh, in Venezuela and Lebanon. Here's a chart just showing that the volatility hasn't gone down. So the volatility is these dark peaks uh, and since 2011, it's pretty much stayed the same. 
the, the lines are showing how the value has risen over time. So the rising value of Bitcoin measured by the market capitalization hasn't diminished uh, the percentage variation in the value uh, as measured by deviations from the moving average. So we have to wait and see, uh, of course, how well cryptocurrencies, uh, Bitcoin being the leading case, are going to catch on. Uh, and one of the pioneers of cryptocurrency, a guy named Nick Zabo, who was writing about the idea before Bitcoin was launched. And so some people think he may be Nakamoto or one of the co-authors of the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, in fact, somebody did a textual analysis of his writings and compared it to the Bitcoin white paper and said that he's the best match by use of uh, vocabulary and sentence style. And personally, I hope uh, Nick Zabo is part of it because he cited something I wrote once. So I would love to have been cited by Nakamoto. Uh, but way back in 2011, when it was just getting off the ground, they said, look, there are lots of open questions uh, which can only be settled by actually fielding them and seeing how they work in practice. And I think what we've seen over the last 10 years since he wrote that is Bitcoin has acquired a niche use as a way of transferring value uh, that resists censorship but it hasn't yet become uh, widely accepted. And as long as central banks mind their business and keep inflation low, I won't expect uh, Bitcoin to achieve status as a widely accepted medium of exchange. So uh, let me wrap it up there and take questions. Thanks. I would say that there is constant talk right now. Um, are we going to go into a higher inflation period? And of course, you talked about that. Um, but I mean, I, I used to think of gold as a hedge for uh, for for inflation. And we look mm -hmm. at the gold prices, and gold prices are going down. Um, and actually, there's much more uh, activity um, in Bitcoin uh, right now. So the question is: Is did, did Bitcoin switch? gold as a inflation hedge and um, what's your take on that? Yeah, so I've been talking about uh, Bitcoin as a potential money, uh, as an inflation, sorry, as an investment vehicle. Um, I don't have a lot to say. Its price is hard to predict because it's based entirely on market sentiment and market sentiment is hard to predict. Um, unlike gold, which has some fundamentals, it has some industrial use and it has a predictable supply coming out of the mines, which does respond to price. So when the price of gold is high, uh, the output of the mines ramps up and it may take 10 years, but the price of gold does tend to revert to uh, a long run trend. Uh, whereas I, I think you're right. Some people are looking at Bitcoin and saying, well, the sky's the limit with Bitcoin. Um, and so they're piling in. Uh, I don't think it's entirely replacing gold as a medium of exchange, sorry, as an investment vehicle. Um, but among younger investors, uh, probably so. It's, it's easier actually to buy than gold there are no storage costs associated with it. Uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve to store it in the safe way, which is to hold your own key. If you leave it on an exchange, there's danger that the exchange gets hacked uh, and your account gets emptied. Uh, but lots of people are getting over that. There are lots of books being published promoting Bitcoin as an investment. Uh, so yeah, I would say that if you look at 
Bitcoin's market capitalization relative to golds. So golds is something like 10 trillion and Bitcoin is now about 1 trillion. Bitcoin is gaining. All right, thank you. Uh, so we have another question from Corinne. Um, what do you think of the development of uh, DeFi and I'm, I hope I'm reading this correctly and the value proposition of uh, BTC? So DeFi stands for decentralized finance and it's very much in its infancy, but people are building sort of financial institutions outside of the banking system that are based on cryptocurrencies uh, being borrowed and lent, uh, being invested in all kinds of weird things I don't understand like yield farming. I'm not even sure what that means. Uh, so I don't understand enough about DeFi to really speak to it. Uh, but people are looking for a way to own Bitcoin and get a yield on it, get some interest or earnings on it, as well as appreciation in the price. Uh, I would be very wary of putting a lot of value into any particular uh, vehicle in that space because you need to do your diligence uh, as to exactly how it works and make sure it's not a Ponzi scheme of which there have been many uh, or a sort of greater fool thing that where it only works as long as somebody else is willing to pay even more than you did. There's been a lot of talk in recent weeks about uh, ETFs, not sorry, not ETFs, uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, uh, which are like digital works of art that can't be copied and people are paying big sums basically just for exclusive access to some digital object like a picture. I don't really understand how that's gonna pan out in the long run. <laughs> so I would stay away from that. But um, as far as diversifying your wealth portfolio, putting a couple percent in gold and a couple percent in Bitcoin is makes very much sense according to standard efficient market hypotheses. You want to diversify your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so J Jonathan um, is asking, I think maybe you address some of this in your talk. Uh, what do you think will the future uh, uses of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies be? What part of the global economy economic system could it replace? So the biggest, the biggest opening is in high inflation countries um, to the extent that people can uh, move transactions into Bitcoin, uh, there's a chance for it to take off in a bigger way. Uh, and of course, one of the advantages is that it's stateless. So it's easy to move your Bitcoin in and out of whatever country you're in. Uh, it has that advantage. But it has this volatility, which is, I mentioned, is kind of constraining how attractive it is relative to the US dollar or the Euro or whatever your local currency is. So for the near future, I guess I expect it to continue to be an investment vehicle or store of value more than a medium of exchange. Um, as the cost of getting in and out of Bitcoin comes down, as people become more familiar with it, um, it might spread, the transaction use of it might spread a bit, but it's had 10 years to do that and hasn't done very much. Uh, certainly not much compared to people's expectations five years ago. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, okay, and Yav is asking, is it possible the central banks will convert their fiat money into a digital currency? Um, I don't think convert is the right word, but supplement, yes. So lots of central banks are talking about launching what's called a central bank digital currency. Uh, I've written about it in other places. Um, well, 
I can plug my blog here. I, I write on a blog called Alt M, A L T hyphen M dot O R G. Uh, but a central bank digital currency is not like Bitcoin. Uh, central banks are not going to launch something with a fixed quantity whose value they can't control. The, pro uh, the, the kind of digital currency projects they're talking about would have a fixed value in terms of the central bank's fiat money. So in Sweden, they're talking about an e-krona. Uh, in the Bahamas, they've actually launched something called a sand dollar, where the Bahamian dollar is the unit of account. So it's not going to be floating against uh, the cur existing currencies. It's going to be a different way to hold and transact existing currencies. In the most popular models that are being discussed, it's not even on a blockchain the way Bitcoin is. It's simply on the central bank's balance sheet. So it's not a distributed ledger operation. It's very much a central ledger proposition where people could have account balances on the central bank's balance sheet and transfer them peer to peer directly without going through commercial banks. Uh, that's the, the leading model of central bank. They, they call it digital currency, even though it's not a currency. That is, it's not a peer to peer mechanism. It's central bank retail accounts for everyone. Currently, only commercial banks have accounts at the central bank. The proposal here is to uh, let anybody have an account at the central bank. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it's all that valuable an idea. Central banks are not experienced at providing retail payments, at dealing with millions of customers. They're used to dealing with dozens of banks, which is much easier. They have no experience in consumer service. They don't have the number of tellers you would need to answer the phones from people who want information on their accounts and why a certain payment didn't clear and so on. Commercial banks, well, in the US, I had actually looked this up. There are over 400,000 bank tellers. That's about 20 times the number of employees at the Federal Reserve System. So having them take over that business would be an incredible change. And I don't think they want to do that. And I don't think they're qualified to do that. Uh, but central banks that are introducing a digital currency are doing it a way, in a way that involves minimal customer service. So in China, it's supposed to be uh, transactable peer to peer online or from card to card. Uh, but in China, it's being introduced for basically for surveillance purposes so that the Chinese government can track everyone's spending. So once they've got everybody using digital currency, they can eliminate paper currency, which they can't track. Uh, and so that's not the kind of project that uh, any free country ought to want to emulate. Okay, uh, so we have two more. Um, thank you. So Gandhi is asking, um, this is a, I think an interesting question. The government accepts the wealth transfer that would result from widespread acceptance of Bitcoin. So for example, early adopters are usually high income people and they get it in the beginning. And then if in fact it does become um, a more widely spread um, phenomena, then the lower income people are going to show up late and have uh, much less uh, stake in the game and uh, their Bitcoin value would be much lower. So he's asking if governments uh, can accept this uh, situation. Well, it'd be interesting to actually do a study of people who are currently holding Bitcoin and ask, um, are they, is the distribution of Bitcoin similar to the distribution of wealth? Is it sort of uh, concentrated at the top? I'm not sure it is, at least from interacting on, with people on Twitter about Bitcoin which I don't recommend unless you have time to kill. <laughs> uh, a lot of people are, are just retail 
ordinary investors who you know might otherwise be day traders of stocks uh, who were trading GameStop stock. Uh, if you only have a hundred dollars to play with, you can buy a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. Uh, so, and then of course they've gotten a lot of resistance from established financial institutions um, and regulatory authorities who have imposed uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering rules on cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, there of course are some prominent uh, people in the 1% like Elon Musk who have recently uh, joined the party and uh, I guess uh, before him the celebrity spokespeople were the Winklevoss twins uh, who were already rich but got even richer going big into Bitcoin and being lucky that the price went up. Uh, so yeah, so I'm not sure it's true that if, and then this is what the people who currently own Bitcoin are counting on, that if everybody else piled in later, it pushes the price up, they get even richer. Um, what can we do about that? Is, is that something to object to? Well, uh, appreciation of your Bitcoin is taxable. At least in the United States, it's taxed as a capital gain. Uh, and I know this because I had to fill out the forms when I sold one, some. Uh, I gave a talk to a group in Amsterdam called Bitcoin Wednesday, and they insisted on paying me in Bitcoin. Uh, so I learned firsthand about all the hoops you have to jump through to convert your Bitcoin to dollars. Uh, know your customer rules and all that. Yeah, so so the, the gains on Bitcoin are already taxed uh, and it's, it's a hassle to uh, comply. Uh, now the, the, the Bitcoin maximalists say, we'll never sell. Their slogan is just hold it or for some reason they misspell it, H-O-D-L, so hodl. You just hodl your Bitcoin and never sell it, then you never incur the tax liability. But then you haven't really increased your standard of living Right? You haven't increased your consumption from uh, your wealth having risen with the Bitcoin you own. Um, so I'm, I don't see a lot of uh, populist outrage about people making money on Bitcoin. Um, but I suppose the taxes could be uh, made steeper if, if that's what the people thought was more equitable. Okay, thank you. So we'll ha we have uh, one last question. Um, it's a question about uh, inflation, which is a classic question of the, the CPI, for example, in Israel or an equivalent in the States actually represent uh, inflation um, because there are other uh, views that inflation is actually much higher than what the CPI reflects. So the CPI is uh, a rough and ready measure of the prices of goods uh, and the goods are supposed to be weighted according to their prominence in a typical consumer's basket of uh, purchases. Uh, one controversial aspect of that is that when the quality of a good increases, like tires that used to last 20,000 miles, now less 60,000 miles. How do you adjust for that in the price of tires that goes into the price index? So that is a problem, but I don't see any reason to think that there's been a sort of systematic cheating on the quality adjustments such that uh, the CPI is drastically understating uh, inflation. There are alternative price indexes. Uh, there's something called the Billion Prices Project where they scrape online prices um, to construct a, a measure of inflation. And those inflation rates are actually pretty close to the CPI inflation rates. Um, 
uh, there's another index called the everyday price index where they just they don't count consumer durables but just things people buy every day gasoline and food and so on mm -hmm. uh, and those inflation rates are not very different from CPI rates some people have been concerned about the quality adjustments and have claimed that if you take those out you see the true inflation being much higher than it is uh, but I don't put all that much stock uh, in those claims. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm open to evidence that uh, there's some kind of s serious bias in the CPI, but I haven't seen it. Uh, you know, back on this inflation issue. Um, so interest rates have been creeping up in the United States. So the general assumption is there's, there's two possible reasons. One reason interest rates could be going up is, is because of anticipation of economic growth. Another possible reason interest rates could be going up is because of inflationary expectations. Yeah. So uh, which do you think it is? Um, I think it's inflationary expectations. And I, I say that because interest rates haven't gone up at the short end where in like over a year uh, from, from overnight to one year, you haven't seen any rise in interest rates. And you should see that if it was increased demand for business loans, mm -hmm. but where it's risen is at five years and 10 years and further out, mm -hmm. which suggests that people think in the long run, there's gonna be slightly more inflation. Now that the changes haven't been big they've been like 20 basis points, 30 basis points at those horizons. So if you compare the five year and 10 year rate on ordinary treasury bonds with the rates on inflation indexed bonds, that's where you get your market-based forecast of inflation. And that's what's been going up, uh, but yeah, 20 or 30 basis points. Uh, so people are starting to expect something closer to 2% inflation instead of, you know, 1.6% inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, if it gets above 2% expectations, then the Fed may have to uh, react to that. But they claim to be happy that it's moving closer to 2% because that's supposed to be their target. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, over the last few months, there's been an interesting phenomenon with regard to the relationship between the dollar and the shekel. And, uh, and uh, I guess over in a period of maybe the last, I don't know, f four months, the, at, you know, at one, at one point, the, uh, the exchange rate went from about um, 3.4, 3.45, something like that, to uh, it dropped down below 3.2. And uh, at that point, everybody over here started going crazy and the Bank of Israel uh, said they're gonna start intervening in the market to, uh, uh, to, to turn that around. Uh, now, when, when these things start happening between currencies, that also leads to the same type of question. What, what's happening relative to one country rel relative to the other? Are we, are we looking at relative changes in expected inflation? Or are we looking at relative changes in expected growth rates? Uh, so I was wondering if, if you wanted to speculate about what's going on there. Well, the, the standard theory of exchange rates is the purchasing power parity theory that the exchange rate between two currencies will satisfy arbitrage conditions that internationally traded goods are not cheaper in one currency than the other. So that means that the changes in the exchange rate reflect differences in, in changes in the exchange rate reflect changes in the relationship between the two price levels. So yeah, changes in the exchange rate are leading indicators of changes in the inflation differential. And so the shekel strengthening against the dollar is a leading indicator of lower inflation in Israel than in the United States. Now, you'd have to look at sort of the 
dollar index of all foreign exchange rates to know whether the, the changes on, and similarly for the shekel, to know whether the changes on the Israeli side or on the dollar side where inflation expectations are changing. Well, generally speaking, uh, over this period, it, it, the dollar really was just weakening everywhere. Okay, well then it's in the dollar. <laughs> I mean, at different rates, at different places, but generally speaking, is 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 uh, weakening everywhere. Okay, let me let me ask you one other thing. I want to go back to the the title that you gave this talk. You know, and uh, the the title being, can Bitcoin essentially be a discipline? On inflationary monetary policies in different different countries. Yeah, I'm not I'm not really sure that you have explicitly answered that question. I mean, so, basically, basically, what you said is in places in places where there's already a lot of inflation, so there could be a movement out. Uh, but right, and and it doesn't stop the inflation, but it does allow people to protect their wealth. Whereas, there's already a lot of competition among fiat currencies. That disciplines central bank monetary policies, and to the extent that uh, Bitcoin adds one more currency to the mix, then it could have some marginal effect on constraining inflation. And at this point, being worth a trillion dollars, Bitcoin is up there with some of the larger currencies in the world. But but there's one difference. Okay. And uh, the difference is, you know, we're talking about private markets versus government. And the, the intellectual appeal of this is, is that we know that, that one, one problematic thing about, about fiat currencies or government currencies is, is the government is running these shows. So, and the interesting thing with Bitcoin is suddenly you have a currency in which government is not involved. And, and in that sense, the title of the talk is really kind of interesting because we, you know, we have an intuitive sense that a private market is always, always going to be more efficient and a source of discipline. So in what sense over the long run can we think about things going in, in, in this direction and changing the reality of governments controlling money? Well, uh, if you go to my Twitter page, you'll see that the motto I've given myself, because everybody has something under their picture that describes them. Uh, my motto is studying private currency since before it was cool. So meaning before Bitcoin even came on the scene, I was writing about free banking and private alternatives to government control of money. Uh, and so Bitcoin's not the only alternative model. There's also the classical gold standard with a, without a central bank, with a system of uh, free banking. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to me the, the monetary system that markets evolved before governments took over. The question about Bitcoin uh, is whether it's the best design for uh, a basic monetary unit, this design where there's completely inelastic supply and changes in demand make the purchasing power go up and down violently. I'm not sure it is. Now, I'd be happy to be wrong. I'd be happy if everybody uh, jumps on the Bitcoin bandwagon and completely refuses uh, to use government currency. If that's the market verdict, that's fine. Uh, I'm not expecting that. So you're right, uh, you can't trust central banks to honor their commitments. Uh, and in, if I, in my heart of hearts, uh, it seems to me that a commodity standard has more time tested robustness uh, and is something I defend as a, that's a reasonable alternative, although I'm not expecting any country to adopt it, but central banks should at least not do worse than the uh, classical gold standard did when it came to inflation, which means closer to a zero inflation rate than a 2% inflation rate. Mm -hmm. But if that's out of the picture, then our choices are between 
Bitcoin and uh, fiat currency. Uh, what I'm saying is don't put all your wealth in Bitcoin yet because it's very difficult to use as a medium of exchange right now. And as long as it remains volatile, which I expect in purchasing power, there are going to be disadvantages of using it. So I would expect the market verdict to swing heavily to Bitcoin only if all the fiat currencies went haywire. And we've seen individual cases of fiat currencies going haywire, but I wouldn't wish for all the fiat currencies to go haywire. Right, uh, so we have one last question. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's a little bit personal. So if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. So the L is asking um, if you are personally invested in Bitcoin. And I, I would also like to add another uh, question. You said before we started the session, you said you spoke to two Israeli startups uh, that are involved in crypto. Um, and I see maybe people would be uh, happy to hear about them. I could also put their, uh, their names in the chat. And if anybody wants to look at them, I can look at them. Um, so those are the two uh, final questions. Um, I will just say that I have less Bitcoin than I wished I had. <laughs> or that I wish I had. Uh, so no, I have, partly because I want to maintain my uh, neutrality about it, but <laughs> yes, it's, I, because I'd known about it for a long time. I had a student tell me about it in 2010, back when it was about a dollar a share. Uh, and this is kind of a personal story. Another student, kind of as a, a dissertation student of mine, kind of as a joke, when he graduated, I think this was 2011, gave me uh, certificates for what purported to be 2.1 Bitcoin. And it had a, a it, it was a kind of digital wallet, they called it. It had a QR code where supposedly the, uh, contained the uh, Bitcoin key. Uh, when Bitcoin got to about $5,000, I said, maybe I shouldn't have these on my wall. <laughs> Somebody could uh, read the key and steal them. But uh, when I went to try to identify whether I really had these Bitcoin, I, it turned out they didn't work. <laughs> so I nearly made more money in Bitcoin. Uh, I, the the pro other projects that uh, you mentioned that I mentioned, there's a, a cryptocurrency that launched a little more than a year ago called Beam, uh, which B -A -M is B-E-A-M or B-E-E-M? B-E-A-M. Mm -hmm. So it's Beam cryptocurrency, uh, which is run by some uh, Israeli entrepreneurs. Uh, and I've talked to them. I, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, part of the management or anything, but they've uh, talk to me. Uh, and there's another project, which isn't actually a cryptocurrency, but an alternative payment proposal called Initiative Q, uh, which is run by uh, a guy named Sar Wilf, who used to design security software for PayPal. Uh, and this is his own project. And it's been going on for a, at least three years, and he's lined up something like 6 million people have volunteered their email addresses to link into the payment system once it goes live. But as I understand that he's trying to raise venture capital uh, by saying to the investors, look, I've got this many people lined up who are ready to use this uh, payment system. But that's, it's not a cryptocurrency, so there's not a, a source code that limits the quantity. The idea is that it would be, there would be like a central bank board uh, that tried to maintain the purchasing power constant. And um, uh, he needs more advice from me about how to actually implement this, but <laughs> I contributed to the white paper, which is on their website, which talks about the idea in principle of stabilizing the purchasing power by varying the quantity. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, for participating. My pleasure.
And uh, so you, you want to be paid in Bitcoin for? Uh... <laughs> Whatever's easier for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. And I guess.